I'm told that there are about four million snooker and billiard players in Britain. It's largely played by amateurs. And in fact, there are not more than 40 professionals in the whole world. And this is their great meeting of the year, the World Professional Snooker Championships, held this year in Sheffield. This is the event they all most desperately want to win. Win or get into the last eight or so, be seen on television, and you've hit a potential jackpot. It's a dream of all the young players. Fail, and you're back on the bread and butter circuits. Another year to wait, another year of endless practice. David Taylor is one of the young pros who got knocked out in Sheffield. He's an ex-amateur world champion. I was 23, 24, just won a world title, thought, oh yes, this is, this is tremendous, you know. And I didn't realise how tough it was. I thought you'd just pick your cue up and play snooker and that was the end of it, not the balls in the hole. There's a lot more to it. What's it like being married to a professional snooker player? Um, difficult. I do get very nervous, but I think all the wives do, you know. I, uh, I sit there and sort of um, riveted to the table, you know. But uh, I wouldn't miss it. I couldn't, I couldn't stay outside and not watch, you know, like. I know some wives do, they can't bear to watch, but I can't bear to stay away. <laughs> It is very lonely out there, and especially I, I always put my wife just by the side, you know, in a chair so as I can come back and chat to her. Mm. And it's great when you're in front, you know, I mean, no problems, you come back and you say, oh, that was a good shot, and blah, blah, <laughs> and things are going all right, and you're just quite happy, and then things go wrong, and you get a couple of frames down, and you come back and you say, so and so and so and so, and she says, well, why don't you do this? And you say, oh, shut up, you know, because <laughs> you don't want to know. You, you, like you say, it's very lonely out there. You want somebody to talk to, but you don't really.
at the moment, there's only one woman professional, Joyce Gardner, a much respected player who, as a young girl, toured the country with the famous suffragette as her chaperone. There's so few places still where a woman can go in and uh, pick up a cue and uh, have a game in the same way as a man can. And it's only until uh, there are tables everywhere where women can play that you're going to have the really great women players. Snooker is a fairly new game, only 100 years old. But billiards is very ancient. Norman Clare. There's some indication that it was even known in ancient Greece and Rome. Yeah. Certainly there is a... a a record of an old Irish king, Cat Kiri Moore, who left behind some cues and balls uh, made of brass somewhere around the 4th century. Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, when she was uh, incarcerated in Farthingay Castle, you know, before she was executed, she wrote a letter to uh, Elizabeth of England, that's Elizabeth I, uh, saying, send me my billiards table, I pray thee. It's almost certain that the game of billiards is related originally to games such as croquet because in the very early pictures which uh, still exist you will see uh, little hoops rather like croquet hoops on the surface of the table. What about the cues? Well the cues originally was something like this or even earlier still they were very short and you didn't make a bridge with your left hand you rested this on the table and struck the ball with the head of the mace. Yeah. Uh, as we came on from those days, there was a, a, a French gentleman named Mingo who found that he could play some shots better if he used the other end of the mace. Willie Smith, a famous billiards champion of the past and a great friend of the late Joe Davis. Now he's 93. I have two medals here, second to Joe Davis. Everybody was second to Joe in those days, and by the way, don't forget, he was one of the greatest brilliant players who ever lived. The people talk about Joe at snooker, but he was a beautiful brilliant player, yeah. one of the greatest ever. He was really. But my... you never liked snooker, did you? And no. I'd, I'd, I want to know why. Well, it's crude compared with the billiards. It's a crude game. And Joe and I used to have little friendly arguments about this. He said, Smithy, this is the coming game. I said, well, I know the public are mugs in many cases, but they'll not fall for this. And I was wrong. Now, I find the young players today, which I find disappointing, they concentrate their time entirely on snooker. They don't know anything about the beauty of the game of billiards, which is a lovely game to play and most satisfying. In fact, Joe Davis said to me one day, you know, Joyce, I really love to play billiards. I have to play snooker for my living. But he said, I love to play billiards. It's a beautiful game. Can you learn how to be a great player? No. I was always dead against coaching, and I still am in every game. You can tell them what to do at every sport, but you can't put it there. If it isn't there, you can't put it there. But you still haven't told me what is the gift that makes a great player. Can you say it? The only thing I can say about that, in every game, to be a great player is a gift from Almighty God. John Virgo lives in Manchester. He also failed to come through at Sheffield. Obviously the main thing is to be the world champion, you know. Do you expect to achieve it? Oh, I did do until uh, Fred Davis, who's 64, beat me this year, you know, which was a bit surprising to me. Uh, I feel as though I've got the ability, maybe my temperament's just a bit suspect at the moment, you know. And, uh, I've got to wait another year now to be world champion. 
Do you bro did you brood about it? Uh, is it still worrying you? Well, it does worry me. I mean, obviously, you know, I uh, lost in the United Kingdom Championship uh, from a winning position uh, to Patsy Fagan in the semi-final. Uh, then I thought, right, well, I'll put that one straight, you know, and do well in the World Championship. And then it's happened again when I was in a winning position. And uh, obviously now I've got to think about my temperament and my tactics, you know. I think the worst period we ever had was after last year's World Championships. And for about a week, neither of us slept at all. Really, it's yourself that you've got to beat? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I have great confidence when I go into the match, and probably great confidence is shown by virtue of the fact that I get in winning positions. But once I get there, I just seem to stop, you know. It's like a racehorse who goes in front in the last furlong, and then all of a sudden thinks he's done enough, you know. And there's nothing, of course, he can do about it. You know, you see him play a terrible shot, or they seem to be having a mental blank where they're playing uh, bad for a period of time, you know, and there's just nothing you can do about it. You know, you die to go down and say, you know, waken yourself up, or you can do it, or get out there and do your job, or whatever, and you just can't get near them at all. You've just got to let them get on and do whatever they're doing. Why is it so important to win the World Championship? Is it just money? Uh, well, I suppose money, because when you're a professional snooker player or a professional at any sport, you know, to be the top of your sport, then obviously you get the rewards that go with it, you know, and to be the world snooker champion, uh, then everybody wants to see you at the club, you know. The bread and butter of this game really is at the working men's clubs up and around the country. And uh, if you're world champion, then everybody wants to see you. I mean, there's no doubt at all John's going to be a world champion in the near future, and he is number one player. It's just a case of his own temperament and himself actually realising his own ability and getting out there and doing it. Jim Meadowcroft lives in Bakeup in Lancashire, yet another pro who's knocked out of the championship. He started playing when he was 14. I went down to the local billiard hall, uh, being too young to get into the clubs and so on. And, uh, of course, it was badly thought of with uh, my parents. You know, my father, of course, he, he sort of went mad about the idea. He said uh, you, you shouldn't go in these billy dolls because they're, they're a den of iniquity and so on. This is where all the trouble starts. And then after a couple of uh, good islands, he said to me, look, this is what I'll do. He said, I'll take you down to the billy doll. He said, and if you can beat me at snooker, he said, then you can carry on going in. He said, but if I beat you, you've got to stop. So I took him down to the billy doll and, uh, of course, we played um, one frame of snooker and I murdered him. And, of course, he's helped me since then in every way. Well, I'm just coming up now to, uh, to my six years of role. And uh, after the first couple of years, I was in two minds whether or not to give it up. I've seen a time when I've had to borrow the petrol money to drive to and from an exhibition. And uh, on the odd couple of occasions, when the wife's allowed it, I've even taking the mortgage money. When they're not playing, they're travelling. Endless travel. But the rewards are high, especially if you're world champion. Well, I should imagine, I mean, uh, Ray could verify this. I doubt whether he'd tell us, but I should imagine that he's making within the region of about £50,000 a year. About 70, 80000 a year can be earned. If you're right at the top of the tree. Um, Every year, you, you know, you get beat in the championships uh, or uh, you don't do as well in a competition as what you thought you'd do. And you think, oh, I feel like giving the game up, you know, had enough. And then you see Fred Davis comes along, 64 years old, yeah. and, and gets to the semi-final of the World Championships. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. And, and this gives you heart, of course, but by the same rule, he is one of the hardest men in the game, and he also always leaves you with a story of how hard you've got to be to win. And, and take my word for it, Dennis, you've got to be tough, really tough. Oh, Fr Fred looks as though butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Doesn't he, Joss? Doesn't he, Joss? And uh, there's not a harder man in the game. He, he smiles as he kicks you through the floor. <laughs> uh, oh. Ever and uh, he went mad when Eli won ten quid off him. 
ten straight games of cracking and pounding. Must be the missed it last time. It's funny the game. I expected uh, a land of milk and honey, and uh, it just didn't really work out like that. Um, I was waiting for telephone calls every five minutes because it happens wasn't even on the telephone. <laughs> Queuing ability, the best player in the world, in my opinion, is Hurricane Higgins. You think that? Honestly, yes. Yeah. If you could put it all together, as it should be done, and be a gentleman about the game, you would, you would be the best player yeah. in the world. Oh, rubbish. With a person who's got that certain something, it goes on the table, it doesn't matter whether it's 13 or 14, he can pick a queue up, go on the table and he looks good. Now that is the difference, you can bet ten lads and they're all the same age, all 12, 13, and they all look very awkward at a snooker table with a cue in the hand. But you'll get one of them, it might be one in a hundred, you think, ah oh, yeah, he looks good. Where lies the skill? Well, I don't know. We can be very precise about the history of snooker. It was virtually a game invented or constructed by army officers in India in a town called Jubalpur in the year 1875, just over 100 years ago. Most players dream of owning their own table. Barry Price has gone one better. I'll just show you how it works. Barry, do you ever stop working? No way. I enjoy my work too much. It's a way of life for me, is work. I've always enjoyed work all my life. I've worked 14, 15, 16, 18 hours a day ever since I was a kid. You're mad about snooker, aren't you? Yeah, I've seen me travel two, two and a half hundred mile a day to watch snooker. I went out and bought a table, 40 quid. Put it up at building until I had time to get at it. Uh, then I went out and got all the uh, hydraulic equipment I wanted for, for the table. Uh, which obviously saves a lot of money. If you have to go and get it, it costs you a lot. If you don't want it, yes. you can get it for now. If you tend to leave the game alone, I think, for any longer than a couple of weeks, uh, there's a tendency that you lose your form, even when you've perhaps been playing brilliant snooker. What a lovely shot. So the idea is, I think, to, uh, to keep practising, and hopefully you're going to keep fairly consistent. What happened in the World Championships? Well, it's, from my part, I think, Dennis, a bit of a disaster, really. Because um, against playing against Pat Houlihan uh, this particular year, who I've met twice before. In fact, it's only November that I've played him in the UK Championships. And uh, I knocked him out in the round before I played Ray Reardon, mm -hmm. beating him by eight frames to one. But, of course, when I played him at, uh, at Romley in the qualifying sections, it turned out to be a different story because he finished, uh, finished
Finish me off 9 6. Make it look easy. I'm beginning to wonder that myself. I think it's so easy. I wish the world championship was tomorrow, you know. <laughs> I really feel confident. I remember when I started playing snooker at first and Joe Davis was giving me a bit of advice uh, about the game, or at least I thought the game was snooker. And he turned around and he said to me, you know, he said, this isn't a game, lad. He said, it's a science. The holiday camp circuit provides employment for some of the pros. David Taylor, for example, in and around the Isle of Wight, driving 1,300 miles a week. John Virgo at Skegness and Clacton. Jim Meadowcroft at Filey and Pathelli. Down onto the shop and we'll see just how you look from there. How's that? Fine, you can take the shot when you're ready. I'll miss it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Told you. Almost. Can you play it in here? Pardon? <laughs> Potting the red is the first thing, and the red gives us then an opportunity to take a colour. Somebody move the ball. Yeah, somebody move that yellow ball. Push it through, very gentle. Fine, that's a good that's start. Not. the skill well I don't know to be a great player is a gift from Almighty God this isn't a game lad he said it's a science I've got to wait another year now to be world champion <laughs> 